Hello and welcome to another F-Expansion Strobe 2 tutorial. In this video I want to take a look at what's new in Strobe 2. So for all you Strobe 1 fans this will be a good look at what's new, what's interesting and what features you should check out. So starting right at the top, probably the most asked for feature by Strobe 1 users was a resizable interface and here it is. Underneath this tools menu here we have the magnification menu and this allows you to resize the interface to suit your monitor. So we can go smaller, larger. Um, for my particular use I'm enjoying it at 150% because I have a 1440p monitor. The interface is entirely vector drawn and what that means is everything still looks clear and sharp and really nice. The other thing to mention on the interface is that we now have two themes, a dark theme and a light theme. I'm going to stick with the dark one. So the next big thing on the list is the browser. The browser can be folded away by clicking this button up here and it gives us a really nice way to access the 900 plus brand new presets that are shipped with Strobe 2. In the browser we can choose to view things by preset type. So for example if I just wanted to look at lead sounds I'd select that here and there we can just see all the lead sounds. I can select by library. Uh, currently I'm just looking at the factory but at some point later we will be releasing preset packs uh, and these will come up under the library tag here. Favorites is a really nice system. Every preset listed in the browser has this little star by it and all I have to do is click it and it will appear in my favorites list. We can also view by the artist, i.e. who made the actual presets. If you have a favorite sound designer then you can easily see all their presets together here. There's also a search function. If I know the name of the preset I'm looking for I can quickly get it here. The legacy button will show me strobe 1 presets. Now strobe 2 does load strobe 1 presets and the legacy button shows us those. Finally I can import presets which allows me to uh, import into the library presets that I've downloaded or that a friend has shared with me. I can save presets and I can easily scroll through presets using the next and previous preset buttons. So let's move on to another big addition, the effects section. Strobe 1 had no effects whatsoever and the idea behind that was that we wanted to make a synth that sounded great on its own without using tons of delay and reverb to kind of hide basically what would be a weak synth engine. And Strobe 1 achieved that and I think now that we've got that strong core synth engine adding effects was the next logical thing to do. So on the effects tab we have six insert effects and there are 28 different effects that you can choose from. A lot of these come from our other products such as Geist and BFD but some of them are brand new and unique only to Strobe 2. First up there's Dirty DAC which emulates old digital to analog converters and that can give a nice warm sort of digital crunch to the sound. There's also the phase mod array which is a really interesting and unique effect which uses multiple sine waves and resonators to create a really unique sound. You have to try it. I'm not actually going to demonstrate these effects today. We might cover them in a later tutorial but we simply don't have time in this tutorial to have a look at every effect. And another new one is the pattern delay. It's a really nice delay effect which uses multiple taps to create um, really interesting rhythmic pattern delays. So moving on, again brand new is the randomizer. The randomizer allows us to make subtle changes to many parameters in a patch using just this XY square here. Whenever I use the XY square and I release the mouse button, a new patch is added to the quick preset randomization menu here. And you can see a history of all the random presets that I've created so I can always go back to them. The randomizer is designed to work in tandem with the quick presets panel. That's this part here. You can see eight slots, each of which can hold a preset. And I can morph between each one as I go. 
Using the right-click context menu, I can copy and paste between any of these slots, so I can use the randomizer and then copy them into one of the quick preset slots. I've got some quick presets that I created earlier. By setting this morph time here, I can change the amount of time it takes to morph from one quick preset to another. Let's try that out. So you can hear that's a really powerful way of morphing between different presets. Another use for it would be, say, if you're using strobe on stage or in a kind of gigging environment where you want to quickly change between presets for different songs. You can just load in eight different presets here, set the morph time to zero and click between them whenever you need to. One of the other nice features here is that there are different ways to actually trigger these quick preset slots. You can do it via program change, via MIDI control change, or via the bottom octaves of your MIDI keyboard. So on to the next improvement. We have 16 transmod slots. Strobe 1 came with a mere 8, and you can see we now have 16 up here. Other than that, they work in pretty much the same way. You select a slot, you select a source up here, and then you can choose any destination by using the rings around each knob, or by using the background on the faders. It's worth mentioning that all the effect parameters are also transmodable, so loads of power there. Whilst we're on the subject of transmod, we also have some new transmod sources. Over here in the synth effects page underneath the scope, we have the Euclidean modulation source, two curves and two zone remappers. I'm going to cover these in a separate tutorial because they deserve a bit more attention. Other new modulation sources include the Step Sequencer over here on the Arpeggiator page, the Sub LFO, which I'll come to in a minute, and a new Ramp Transient source. The Ramp Transient source uh, gives us a different curve on the Ramp modulation source. So let's have a look at that Arpeggiator Step Sequencer. The arpeggiator features all the usual parameters you'd expect. The rate, which is a division of the master tempo. Different modes, such as forward and reverse. Octave range. Priority. And there's also some interesting things here that regard how the sequencer interacts with the arpeggiator. With everything off, the two behave independently. The arpeggiator goes along, and so does the step sequencer. I can change the sequencer length and it has no effect on the arpeggiator. Retrigger will re-trigger the step sequencer every time a MIDI note comes in. ARP Reset Sequencer will reset the sequencer every time the arpeggiator goes once through its cycle of notes. So you'll see if I reduce the octave range to make the arpeggio shorter, the sequencer resets. Sequencer resets arpeggiator does the opposite. Whenever the sequencer reaches step 1, the arpeggiator is reset and begins its cycle of notes again. So there are some really interesting interactions between the two that can be had. 
There's also a swing function. Gate time. Sequence length, of course. And a slew function, which works on the output of the step sequencer. So if we go back to the synth here, we can see where I applied some step sequencer to the filter cutoff and resonance. That is now gliding smoothly from one step to the next. Another very interesting addition we've made is multi-dimensional MIDI control. Now I'm not going to go deep into this for this tutorial, it'll have its own tutorial. But this option here in the preferences menu enables multi-dimensional control. And this is for MIDI controllers such as the Roly Seaboards, the Roger Lin Linstrument, the Hacken Audio Continuum or the Eigen Labs Eigen Harp. So finally let's take a look at what's new on the actual synth engine itself. Strobe 2 is very much built on the solid base that Strobe 1 created, but we have made some tweaks and improvements along the way. The first one, and this was much requested for Strobe 1, is an oscillator phase reset switch. And what that does is it resets the phase of the oscillator whenever a new note is created. Let me demonstrate that. So here I've got a simple sawtooth waveform. I'll put a bit of stack and detune on it. And then I'll enable the arpeggiator just so that we can hear a sequence of notes. So this is what it sounds like without the phase reset enabled. Now I'll enable it. You can clearly hear that the beginning transient of each note is much more solid and consistent with the phase reset on and that's really good for bass sounds. Next up is the switchable detuning. This button here labelled Sense allows me to change the way the detuning of the oscillator works. Either it comes before the keyboard scaling or after and that affects the way the detune sounds when you play a sound up and down the keyboard. I'll just disable the arpeggiator here and you'll be able to hear. You can hear the beating of the oscillators speeds up and slows down as I move up and down the keyboard. Let me disable this now. You can hear now when I play up the keyboard that the beating that happens between waveforms is consistent Next up we have the sub link unlink button. Strobe 1 had a sub oscillator and if you use the main oscillator's detune, stack and sync functions then the sub oscillator would follow those. If I enable link you'll hear what I mean. So here I can hear the sub oscillator and it has detune and stack applied to it. Sync will also work the same. But if I unlink the sub oscillator, then it will now play me just a simple square waveform, no matter what these three parameters are set to. So on, off. So another useful tool there. Also new are these two tone controls. One in the oscillator section, one in the sub oscillator section. And these are key tracking polyphonic tone controls. So they work very sympathetically with the oscillator itself. Nothing much more to say about those, they're very useful to have just to help shape the sound a little bit more. 
Whilst we're still in the sub oscillator, keen strobe one users might notice that there's an additional octave being added to the octave selection switches for the various waveforms in the sub oscillator. The newest addition is this minus zero octave option. And that allows me to have a sub oscillator that is playing the same octave as the main oscillator. In effect, it simply becomes another oscillator waveform to play with. Lastly, in the sub oscillator, we now have a wave shaper. This will have a different effect depending on which waveform you've got selected. It's just another useful tonal shaping control at your fingertips. Moving across the filter, we have a couple of new features here. The first one is filter leak, and this is quite sweet really. It's an emulation of old analog filters that didn't really work that well or weren't really designed that well. And what happens when you use it is you get a little bit of high frequency leak that comes through the filter regardless of what your filter cutoff setting is set to. So I'm going to make a really basic bass sound here. And then I'll increase the filter leak and you'll be able to hear. Another new feature in the filter section is the gain compensated filter drive. So in strobe one, when you use the filter drive to overdrive the input to the filter, the volume would go up massively and you'd have to compensate it using this amp drive here. In strobe two, the filter drive is completely gain compensated. So you won't get those wild changes in volume anymore. You'll just get the nice tonal changes. from clean to overdriven. Finally, we come to the dual LFO. The dual nature of this LFO is brand new. It used to be a single LFO, but now we essentially have two LFOs. The first is the one you can see in the top in the scope there, and the sub LFO is the one you can see in the bottom. And the sub LFO works on a tempo division of the main LFO, so we can choose uh, one to one ratio, which actually gives us two LFOs running at exactly the same rate, or we can choose anything from an eighth to times eight. And when we change the main rate here, that changes the rate of both LFOs accordingly. <laughs> One of the nice things is we obviously have separate entries for the LFO and the sub LFO, but there's also a nice modulation source for LFO plus sub, and that adds the two together, giving some really interesting waveforms. That's it for this What's New tutorial. Join me for another tutorial soon.